It's been estimated that 85% of the people who are locked up in mental institutions could be released tomorrow if they could handle their personal guilt and shame. I believe that mental health issues that many people are suffering, that they could be healed if they could handle the guilt and shame of their own lives. I believe that you and I would have a much more peaceful experience in our hearts and greater peace with other people. We would treat others better if we could forgive ourselves we'd find it easier to forgive other people. Today's Bible study is about that very process. Would you open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter two? Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians became one of my favorite letters of the New Testament when I was a teenager. I remember hearing an old country preacher challenge us to read Ephesians as if it were a letter we had just received in the mail from the Apostle Paul. Imagine walking out to the mailbox and open up your mailbox and there's a letter from the Apostle Paul written just to you. Ephesians is a book that is, or rather a letter, a personal letter written to Christians, primarily about the love of God the forgiveness of God, the peace of God, and the work of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. How do we develop and maintain positive, healthy relationships with each other? How do we fight the battle against the satanic forces in this world? Those are the major themes of this letter. And what I want us to do today is focus on Ephesians chapter 2 together, because here we will find the, the answer to how we can deal with our own personal guilt and shame of the sin that we have committed or we are committing or we might commit in the future. Nah, not we might commit in the future, we will commit in the future. As long as I'm in this flesh, I want to have difficulty with temptation and weakness and sin. Is it theoretically possible we could live the rest of our life from this point on without sinning? Sure. Is it probable? <laughs> no, not very probable at all. Not very likely. As long as I'm in this, this physical body, I'm going to have difficulties with temptation to do evil or not to do what God has called me to do, both of which would be missing the mark, missing the mark of God's call, missing the mark of how God created me to be, missing his glory, falling short of his glory. The Bible still says, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned. Does, does that include you too? It certainly does me. The word all includes every person who has ever lived who can make a choice, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That missing the mark, every one of us has missed the target. We were aiming at the bullseye or we weren't even looking at the bullseye and trying. Either way, we missed the mark. And as mark missers, we're separated from God, missing the mark and falling short of his glory, mars who we are. It, it, it destroys relationship with God. God did not want that. We don't want that, but we can't do anything about it. God could, huh. and good news, God did. I want us to focus all of our attention now on Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world. Now, why does Paul say, and you were dead? Well, it, because chapter two of this letter, now realize the Bible was not written originally in chapters and verses. You know that, right? I mean, this is a letter. It was written not with any numbers in it at all. There weren't any chapters and verses. Those were added about a thousand years later to help people learn and remember where scripture was or is. So this is page two of the letter, the first sentence, but page one of the letter ends this way. Go back in, into what we call chapter one. Let's, instead of calling them chapters, could we call them pages? All right, and instead of calling them verses, could, we, could I call them line and then call the number? 
and you know I'm talking about chapter and verse, but can we do it that way just to change our, our image of what scripture looks like or how to read the Bible? So look back with me at the first page of Ephesians and line 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, which are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us. What is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that's been named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Pause just a moment. I want you to feel what Paul is talking about in this part of his letter. The last part of page one, Paul says this, the power that is at work within you is the same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead. Now here's a man who'd been crucified, was dead for three days. His body was wrapped up and buried in a borrowed tomb. The large stone was rolled in front of it. Guards were placed outside to keep a dead man's body inside the tomb. And yet three days later, God expressed his power in the physical body of Jesus and raised him from the dead. And that same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead is now active in our lives. The word there is dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite. And I heard a man say one time, God's given us dynamite power but many of us are only living firecracker lives. And that's, that's more true than it is fable. I mean, think about it. God has unleashed the power of the resurrection of Jesus to reside, to live in our bodies by his spirit. That same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead is the same power you and I have to face anything in this life. And God not only raised Jesus, but think about the power it took to raise Jesus and keep him alive. Not only keep him alive, but God raised him above all so that every authority was under his feet and all things have been placed under his feet. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 or page 15 of that letter, we're told in the first letter to the Corinthians, page 15, everything's been placed under his feet except death. And that final victory is going to be won in the final resurrection where God expresses his greatest display of pressure, of, of rather power, when he raises all the people from the dead, both the good and the bad. Resurrection to life, resurrection to eternal death, separation from him forever. That same power that it took to raise Jesus from the dead, seat him in the heavenlies above all, is that power that is at work within us. And it says, and it put him, put all things under his feet and gave him as head. Now, we usually think of Jesus as the head of the church, but this says he's the head over all things for the church. That is, everything in the universe has been placed under the feet of Jesus, and he uses everything for us, for our benefit. I love that about Jesus. For his church, which is his body. That's us. We are 
the body of Jesus. The next time I have a Bible study with you, we're going to be looking at our identity in Christ. Because you see, if you know who you are, you know how to behave and you know what's yours. We need to know who we are and we need to know whose we are. Then we can understand what we have and we can understand how to live. That's next Bible study. Today we're talking about guilt, shame, and forgiveness. So this power God demonstrated in Jesus is available to us. But then Paul says, all right, we've looked at Jesus. Now let's look at us. Verse one, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. You know, hey, he, he nailed me. How about you? That's my life before I knew Jesus. That's how I lived. It's how you lived. It's how we all lived. In fact, while Paul is writing this in the letter, it, it sounds almost like he's attacking them or holding them up as on the wall of shame. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. All right, think about dead and what dead has to offer. What do you have to offer God when you're dead? Nothing but your deadness. Now realize spiritually dead doesn't mean you're not living physically. It just means that you don't have anything to offer to God spiritually. You're separated from God spiritually. God is love. God is life. God is power. God is holy. You're separated from God. You're separated from real love, real power, real life, real justice, holiness. You're separated from God. But Paul can't just leave himself out now. He's pointed the finger at you and at me. But then watch what Paul does in sentence three of this page of his letter. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We, referring to the Jews, and you, referring to the non-Jews. And I'm probably speaking, the majority of the ones who are involved in this Bible study by on, online with me, you're not physically a descendant of Abraham. You're probably not physically a part of the circumcision, the Jews. You and I are non-Jews. So we would fall in the category of the you in verses one and two. The Jews would be included in verse three, we all. And then the biggest but in the whole Bible is in verse four. It's a but that's spelled with three letters, B-U-T. But, I want you to hear the strength of what Paul is saying. You were dead, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved and raised us up with him. Watch it. And seated us with him in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. So that the coming ages, in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, through trusting. And this is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast, for we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The miracle that took place that Paul is recording in this short section of Scripture is so powerful, and I want you to recognize what happened at the cross of Jesus. Why is it that Jesus had to die? All right, I want you to think with me. In the Old Covenant Scriptures, 
what we would call the Old Testament, there's a law that says that if a man takes one person's eye, his eye is forfeit, an eye for an eye. If a man punches me and hit, knocks one of my teeth out, I can punch him and knock one of his teeth out, a tooth for a tooth. If somebody were to kill another person, that person who murdered, if it's murder, if it's self-defense is a different kind of killing. If it's murder, if it's war, it's a different kind of killing. If it's an accident, it's a different kind of killing. But if it's murder, that individual's life is forfeited. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. That's justice, right? So here I am, I sin, I'm dead to God. I've been killed. Justice says, if I'm gonna be forgiven, that there's a life for a life. So if uh, somehow there could be a perfect human being who would be willing to both love me and give himself for me, to pay the penalty for me, then we could be have an exchange of one man for one man, one man for one woman, a person for a person. You follow what I'm saying, right? Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. Now I realize that that law was given to protect us because if I were to take somebody else's eye, that person could legitimately by justice take my eye, but he can't take my eye and my ear. He can't take my tooth and my left hand. He can't take my life and my family's life and call that justice. It's a life for a life. Okay, so if one man could, could live a perfect life and substitute for another person and take the penalty of that sin into himself, it would only be one man for one man, right? The person who dies for all people would have to have the value of all people. How could that be? I want you to think about this a moment, okay? How many sheep is a person worth? Another way to ask that would be, how many sheep, sheep, bah, lambs, sheep, right? How many sheep would you kill before you would kill one human being? And I can hear you say, well, Kev, I would, I would kill infinite number of sheep before I would kill a human being. And I would say, that's right, because you see, a human being's life is more valuable than a sheep. The human being is created in the image of God. The animal does not have the same imprint of the God-likeness. That is not an image bearer of God. Therefore, the sheep does not have the same value as a human being. I'd kill an infinite number of sheep. What would happen? If, let's say that my friend Herman, I could take a magic wand and tap him on the head and Herman became a sheep, but he was also still Herman. 100% human being, but he is now presently in a sheep's body. He is a sheep, 100% sheep, but he is 100% human being. How valuable would that one human being be? Well, how many sheep would he be worth then? infinite number of sheep because you see he's still a human being even though he is also a sheep how many people is god worth how much more valuable is god than people well the creator is infinitely more valuable than all the human beings who have ever lived, are living, ever will live, or ever could live. Put them all together, and they still don't equal the value of the Creator. The Creator is greater than His creation. What would happen if by some miracle, God could become a human being and still be 100% God? How valuable would that one human being be? You say, well, he would be worth every human who has ever lived, is living, or ever could or would live. He'd be worth all of us together and then some. What would happen then if that one individual died voluntarily, gave his life on a cross, 
a Roman cross where his blood is shed. Why does his blood have to be shed? God has made this statement about blood. The life is in the blood. And when you kill someone and you shed that blood, you have, um, you've taken the value of that person's life away. Now, if Jesus is 100% God and 100% human being, and he lived the perfect life, which he did, not one sin, totally, never did he ever miss the mark. He lived the full glory of God in giving and serving and compassion and mercy and holiness. In every respect, Jesus lived the full measure of the glory of God, which by the way, he shares with his people. Jesus is 100% God, 100% man, the value of every human being. Why? He has the ability to pay the penalty for every person who has ever lived, is living, ever will live, or ever could live. Jesus could take the penalty of those sin, sins into himself. The wrath of God that should be poured on my shoulders rather has been put on the shoulders of Jesus. He has become my, the Bible calls, propitiation, which is a $10,000 word that means a sacrifice to take the heat off. He sacrificed himself to take the full heat of God's wrath on himself so that you and I could be considered right with God, united with God, even to the point that he would wash our sins away totally, never remember them against us ever again. He would put his spirit to live inside our bodies and then empower us to love and to live the way he wants us to. And we cooperate as we grow in understanding who we are and what we have because of what Jesus has done and is doing, that's what the New Testament is all about. Revealing to us who is God revealed through Jesus Christ. Who am I without Jesus? Who am I with Jesus? How has he changed my life? How, what has he made me to be? And who do I now belong to? Because you see, when he paid for me, he paid the penalty. He paid the price. He purchased me. I now belong to him because you see, that's what surrender means. I surrendered to Jesus. The day I was baptized, I remember I was 19 years old. I said to Jesus, I stood in the water with my best friend in the world, Dale. And I said to Jesus, I love you. I want to live for you. And I really want your forgiveness. Please I give you my life, take me, I'm yours. And my friend baptized me into Christ. I was placed under the water, brought up out of the water. Nothing magical happened. Nothing really physical happened. My body, my body got wet, but spiritually, I became a brand new spiritual baby, a brand new life. I'm in Christ now. I belong to Jesus. I live in Him. He lives in me. And it radically changed my life. I've been adopted, born in the family of God. The Bible uses both terms. We'll look at that again in the next Bible study together. So God looks through Jesus to me and He says to me, Kevin, you have sinned. I say, yes, Lord, I have sinned. You've missed the mark. You've rebelled against me. You actually became my enemy. You were a sinner and you deserved my wrath. Yes, Lord, I'm a sinner. I deserved your wrath. I'm confessing to him. And he says to me, but because you're in Jesus, I made you a new creation. I've washed your sins away. I've given you a brand new clean slate. You are now free from the penalty of your sins. And you can still have consequences of your sins in this world. But the eternal consequence of separation from me, God says, has been taken away 
forever because you're in Christ. Remain in Christ. Jesus said it this way in John 15. Remain in me and I will remain in you. My love will be in you. You're going to remain in me like a branch remains in the vine. And if you're bearing fruit, that's a, that's a sign that you are in me. Because if you are in me, you will bear fruit. The commandment there is not that we bear fruit. The commandment is remain in Jesus. That which is on the inside of Jesus will flow through us and be seen in our lives. We, our lives will bear fruit, the inner character of Jesus himself because we remain in him. Now, if you don't remain in Christ, you cannot bear his fruit. And if you're severed, you're cut off from Christ, you don't have life in you. And so Jesus said, if you're not bearing fruit, that's a sign that you're not really in me and God's gonna cut you off. Okay, by the way, that's John 15. I'll let you go back and read that yourself. Here's what I want you to see. God through Jesus has paid the penalty. I look to him and I say, God, you remember last year when I sinned? And God says, let me look at my record. Um, I don't have a record of that. Because you see, it's been erased from my record. Instead, what my record book says to God is right with God. He has placed his righteousness on my page. God made him who knew no sin, Jesus. He never experienced sin to be sin. What was it like for Jesus to die on a cross? I realize it was very painful to have the nails into his hands and into his feet, the crown of thorns on his head, when they beat him with the rods and they whipped him with a whip. I, I know all of that was physically painful, but you know what was more painful than that? was when God in the spirit put every single disobedience or non-obedience when we chose not to obey God. So we chose to disobey or we, and we chose not to obey every sin into the body of Jesus. He, he, he died not just for my sin, but as if he committed my sin. He died as if he were the liar, the adulterer, the murderer. He died as if he were the rapist, the abuser, the drug addict, the drug pusher. He died as if he were the criminal. He died feeling the weight and the guilt and the shame of our sin. He took it into himself. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin. When God looked at his son at that point, all he could see was billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and trillions and quadzillions of sin of every human being who's ever lived or ever will live placed in the body of Jesus. And Jesus said, paid in full. The penalty's been paid. Forgiveness is offered. And that is the beauty of the good news. So when I become a Christian, I allow Jesus to take my life, to clean my life, and to give me brand new life. I, the dead one in my sin, because of my sin, am dead to my sin. What I said was, I'm not gonna live this way anymore. Jesus, I want to live for you now. I've turned my back on sin to the rear march. I was walking this way in sin. Now I've turned my life this way toward Jesus. And when you do that, you're dead to sin. What do we do with dead people? That's right, we bury them. And that's what baptism is, it's the act of burial. It's a faith activity. You're trusting Jesus. That's why baptism now saves you, not because it washes your body, but it's an appeal to God for a clean conscience. 
through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. Because that's true, you were buried with Christ when you're raised up out of the water. Spiritually, you're raised in a new location. You are now in Christ Jesus. And everything that belongs to Jesus, listen, everything that belongs to Jesus now belongs to you. You are in Him. He is an heir of God. You are an heir of God and you're joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Also in Ephesians. So we'll look at that a little later as well. What I want you to recognize is this. You have the ability now, if God has forgiven you, isn't it true that you can forgive yourself? Can you look at the cross and say, penalty has been paid in full? And can you take the person who has mistreated you, somebody you hate, can you take that person to the cross and say, I forgive you, the penalty has been paid in full? What does that do for the other person? Well, maybe nothing. That person may not accept your forgiveness. That's okay. Forgiveness is not just for the other person. Actually, forgiveness is a gift to you from God. If you forgive the other person, <laughs> you're no longer a slave to your own hatred and bitterness. I want to end with this story. I, I met my physical biological dad for the first time when I was 37 years old. He abandoned me when I was a little boy and my mom and dad divorced. He never admitted I was his. And then when I was 37 years old, God arranged a meeting. And I wish I had more time to tell you how this worked, but it truly was, I believe, a miracle for him, number one, to want to meet with me, number two, to admit that I was his son, and number three, to want to create relationship with me. I wanted to with him as well, but I tell you what, for the first time in my life, I realized how much I had hated Jack Fowler, hated him. In fact, I remember I sat across the table from him after he had told me about his life and his family. Then I told him how for 37 years I have hated you. You abandoned me. You didn't set out to destroy a little boy's life, but you did. You didn't set it. You, it wasn't your purpose to scar a little boy's life for his entire life, but you did. That's what happened to me because you abandoned me when I was a child and I have hated you. But I want you to know through Jesus, I have forgiven you. And this is the truth. I told him exactly what I told you. The method of forgiveness is to take him to the cross and see him in Jesus and see the nails through Jesus and through him as well in Jesus and say, the penalty has been paid. Jesus paid the full penalty for you, for me. He paid your penalty for me to be able to forgive you. So I forgive you in Jesus. And I would like to be your friend. And I held my hand across the table to him. It seemed like a long time. Really, it was probably just a couple seconds. Because he smiled and he said, Kev, I, I want to be your friend too and we actually developed a closer relationship with each other. I didn't think it would be possible, but in Jesus, that kind of forgiveness is available. Not only for me to receive from God for everything I've ever done or ever will do. I mean, I'm not gonna go out and sin on purpose so that God will forgive me. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that the death of Jesus covers all sin or it doesn't cover any sin. It covers it all. And as I walk in Him, I stay forgiven. I'm secure when I'm hand in hand with Christ. So, I have that personally. I can lay my head on the pillow at night and say, Phew, I'm okay with God. So I'm okay with me. See, I can look at the cross and now, in my guilt and my shame, I can forgive me. But because of the cross, God has allowed me to forgive my biological dad, who, by the way, is now dead and gone on. There's another man in my life who I had 
grown to hate much later in my life. And I, I know it was wrong. I, I, was sin, I was sinning when I did. But I needed to do exactly with him what I did with my biological dad and take him to the cross of Jesus and say, it's been paid in full. The penalty has been, justice has been met. You are free. I forgive you in Jesus. And quite honestly, he didn't care that I was forgiving him or not. But I cared and it changed my life. It set me free. And that's what I want to happen for you. My friend, I want you to know you can stand forgiven before God. God forgives totally. You can forgive yourself through the cross of Jesus. And listen, you can forgive anybody of anything through the cross of Jesus. I truly believe that. And that is today's Bible study. Would you take just a moment and pray with me and then I want you to answer these two questions afterward. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for us. Thank you for shedding your blood and buying us back, paying the full penalty, paying the price for the wrath of God to be satisfied, the justice of God to be met, the full penalty to be taken care of and wiped clean so that we can stand before Father and call Him Father because of you and receive from Him through you by your Spirit forgiveness and peace and love and joy, patience, kindness, gentleness. We can live a life of self-control. Thank you for those things, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for being our Lord. And thank you for continuing to forgive us by your sin and filling us with your power and giving us second chance over and over and over again. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for the confidence we have in that. Thank you for the ability to forgive other people, to forgive ourselves and to forgive others. Because of your cross and your empty tomb, we live. And we can offer that kind of life to other people as well. Thank you, Jesus, for that. And it's in your name and to your glory, Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to ask you, are you walking in the forgiveness of God? Have you received from Him His forgiveness? Have you been baptized in the Christ yet? I want you to contact somebody who loves you and who knows the Lord and ask him or her to baptize you in the Christ. Number two, have you forgiven yourself through the cross of Jesus? Accept His forgiveness. That's got to be number one. Number two is you need to forgive yourself because every day you look in the mirror at the person who may have become your worst enemy. You need to forgive yourself. And number three, is there anyone in your life that you need to forgive? Would you write that person's name and begin praying for them now and visualize taking that individual to the cross of Jesus and declaring that person free, free from the penalty of the sin Justice has been delivered. The penalty has been paid. Forgive them in Jesus, please. That's the only way you can live in peace. Thank you for being a part of today's Bible study.